This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt back with you for another week of Fireside Chat. And as much as the record win streak or record tying win streak comes to an end, I'm not feeling all that bad right now. How about you, Matt? No, you got to figure that the Flames are going to lose the game eventually. And it was disappointing that the Flames lost, I think, primarily due to a couple of soft goals that got them off their rhythm pretty much right away. But such as life it happens and yeah the flames moved on and beat both dallas and la in convincing fashion well let's talk about those games so the flames were riding high they were riding their 10 game win streak bruins came in they thought that they might be able to get 11 there were some lineup changes before this game i think had a lot of people um unsure of what was going on we saw the Flames starting goaltender, the guy who's led them through the 10 game streak, Brian Elliott, sat out due to the flu. Um, and Michael Stone still out in this game. And Chad Johnson played in net as the Flames lost 5 to 2 to the Bruins. Brad Marchand, Brad Marchand scored his uh, NHL leading 36 goal of the season, and Pasternak scored twice to snap the Flames' 10 game win streak. Um, overall thoughts on this one, Matt? I thought that the Flames played well until the two bad goals were given up, and it seemed like like the Flames did get a lucky break when Hamilton scored from center ice to tie the game at two, but it, that only lasted a few minutes, and the, when David Backus scored and the team just kind of was playing more on their heels instead of their usual game, because... Like, if they make a mistake, the goalie's going to let it in. And it it sort of uh, harkens back to a game, like, from early October or November. You know, I thought that the biggest difference this game compared to the Penguins game is the Flames just didn't have nearly as much jump as they did against the Penguins. They didn't seem to have, you know, they, they weren't finishing everything. They weren't getting in the corners and battling for things. They just seemed sort of like you said, November, December, just sort of, especially at the beginning, kind of coasting through the game. Yeah, and they they did well at times. It's just Boston was frustrating, and they just couldn't seem to get anything going properly. And it's, yeah, it is what it is. It, it, you know, the Flames won a handful of games during the winning streak where they might not have. I'm thinking of the Winnipeg game specifically. If they were not on a roll and... They they were just due for a stinker, and that was one of those games. And Chad Johnson back in net, his first time in net in, I think, just about a month. Um, what did you think of his performance? I think that, as unfair as it is, I think he was the reason why the Flames lost. Because those first two goals were really quite terrible. And then surrendering a sh- a, the third goal was one that he could have had. Like, it it's just enough where like the team kind of changed how they played after that. And he looked it wasn't the same team. Yeah. He, he looked like a guy who hasn't played in a while. Um, and you know, he sort of reminded me of a Kippersoft era backup where it was a guy you never saw the ice and, you know, they'd go in there and they'd look kind of really shaky because they hadn't played in a while. And I think that's important for the flames organization. To remember, as we go forward, that you never know. You're going to need two goalies if you want to go into the playoffs. So as the Flames get closer to clinching, you're going to need to play Johnson more, I think. Yeah, and with the Flames' magic number dropping to six after the LA Kings game, they're closing in on clinching that playoff spot very soon. So like, I'm sure that two or three of those games against the Kings, Ducks, and Sharks towards the end of the season, you may see Johnson in net. So, Matt, for those that don't know, explain the magic number. Uh, the magic number is the amount of wins that either the Flames need to get or 
the ninth place team needs to lose in order for the team to clinch a playoff spot. And so, like, it, when the Flames beat the Kings, the Kings were the ninth place team. Our magic number was eight. It dropped to seven with the win, and it dropped to six with the loss by Los Angeles. So if the Flames win six games out of the remaining ten, then they will clinch a playoff spot even if Los Angeles runs the table and wins out. Similarly, if Los Angeles loses six games, then Calgary could lose out and still make the playoffs. So six games, I mean, that's more than that's more than 500 hockey at this point, but you know, all indications recently show that we can do it. Oh, yeah, and that's... You also have to figure if Los Angeles loses a game or two, that just means one less win that the Flames need to get. So with that game yesterday, uh, the Flames, in effect, clinched a playoff spot. Now it's just figuring out exactly where in the standings they will be once the puck drops in the postseason. Going back to this Boston game, um, I don't know about you, Matt, but I thought by the time we got to the third period, um, by the time especially that uh, Matt Bolesky goal, this game it was all Boston. Like the Flames did what we've seen them before, and they shut down. They didn't shut down as bad as they have in the past, but they just they start stop playing their game. Oh yeah, and they just start, were good at frustrating Calgary, and games like that happen. And the Flames a couple nights later against Los Angeles did very much the same kind of a thing to the Kings. So. Over the course of a season, you're going to have games like that where you just can't get anything going and the other team shuts you down, and vice versa. So Yeah. Not, I, nothing to lose any sleep over, that's And you sure. know what? I think the fact that Johnson was in, I don't want to pin anything on Johnson, but the fact Johnson was in, the fact Johnson was kind of rusty, it's sort of it's a fitting end of the win streak. You know, it's not like we got blown out 7 nothing by Winnipeg, you know, when we were playing our best, like, to me, 10 games was a great run, and now it's over, and as we'll see, the Flames bounce right back. Yeah, and it that was the story I was looking forward to seeing, was once they lost a game, how would the team respond? And that was the question that we all had when the Calgary Flames took on the Dallas Stars, and they the Flames got their 40th win of the year with a 3-1 to one win over the Dallas Stars. Um, and it was interesting. After this game, the Flames have not lost in regulation when leading after 40 minutes. So that's a pretty interesting stat, and we saw that even in the L.A. game. Yep. Now they're 31-0-1 after the L.A. game. We also saw in this game Brian Elliott's 10th win in a row, and that was that's a pretty big feat. I mean, he didn't play one game there, so it's not the team's 10th win in a row, but his. And for a guy who struggled as heavy as he did at the beginning of the season, that's quite an impressive feat. Oh, for sure, and this is the goalie that everybody was expecting that the Flames were getting when they traded a second-round pick for him, and he always seems to, throughout his recent career, he struggles in the early part of the season and then his lights out once he hit January, and you can just see by his numbers over the last couple months, he's just been all that and then some. Right up there with the league's best goaltenders. I thought that this game against Dallas was also one of Giordano's best. He got three points in the game, but he just he played 21 minutes, and he looked very good out there. I agree. He's sort of been, I don't want to say he's been mediocre, but he hasn't been, I don't think, the force that he has in the past. I think the, the story on defense has been other guys this year. It's been Hamilton. It's been Stone. It's been TJ. Gio's definitely been pulling his weight, but I thought that this was one where I really noticed him, especially on the offensive side. Yeah, and he's looking a lot better, and I'm sure he's looking forward to the playoffs for the first time as the captain of the Flames, because, of course, two years ago he missed the entire postseason. So it'll be interesting to see how he does perform once we actually get to the playoffs. As much as we know Dallas has had some goaltending issues this year, um, I really thought that Kerry Lettinen kept Dallas in this game. I didn't think that overall the Stars played a great game. Um, I thought they were pretty much in it until the third period, and then Dallas just deflated in the third. But I thought that Lettinen, I mean, he made a few really good saves in the Flames, and I thought that he was the one that really kept the Flames in there. 
I also thought that the Flames made Dallas give up a lot more pucks in the neutral zone than usual. If you watch the way they played this one, Dallas was coughing it up a lot, and it let the Flames get a lot more offensive zone time than they usually do. Yep, I agree. And it seemed like, and I'd have to check the uh, time on ice numbers, but it seemed like for a good part of this game, the Flames were pretty much rolling four lines. And when I look at the numbers, it looks like they were. So, you know, good to see that we have the confidence that we can do that, that we can run all four lines and, you know, no line is a liability. There's not a lot of teams that can say that. Well, since, uh, like, after the L.A. game, the last 56 games for each of the teams in the NHL, Calgary actually ranks fourth in the NHL in points, only trailing Washington by five points and both Pittsburgh and Columbus by two points. So... The, in fact, like after the Flames adjusted to Glitzen's system, the Flames have been one of the NHL's elite. And with this game against Dallas, you got to see that. And this was an elite team going up against a team that's not going to make the playoffs. And they just simply controlled the play, kept them at bay. Dallas couldn't do anything. And... They skated away with an easy two points. Dallas put some good pressure on at times in the second period, and I thought that Elliott really shut them down well. And uh, I wouldn't say kept the Flames in the game because they didn't need that, but he just he shut Dallas down and frustrated them and took them back out of the game very quickly. Yeah, he made the saves that he needed to, and that was the one of the things that has been so different about this team over past iterations of the Flames is that we have a goaltender that makes the saves that you're expecting him to make. It's probably been since Mika Kippersoff tended the twine here that we've seen that. Yeah, seven, eight, nine years. Because like even when Kipper, towards the end of his reign as a flame, he was not quite as good. And I think, too, if you look at this game, the biggest thing for me was the Flames didn't let themselves get in that funk. We've seen that with so many teams that have gone on a win streak, is they, they get on a, in a bit of a funk afterwards. And the Flames, you know, they lost the one game and they immediately came back. And, you know, won the game against Dallas and won the game against L.A., as we'll talk about. And they've they've fired back. Yeah, and now they get to go up against the best team in the league next week, which that'll be interesting to see how they do. And the team just seems to be on a roll. And after this game, this was Michael Backlund's 451st game. Uh, Backlund achieved a milestone of he's now the Calgary Flames uh, player with the most career games of any European-born player. So we've, we've had some Europeans, not a lot lately, but especially in the 80s, 90s, we had a lot of European guys. But Backlund is young, and he's already achieved that. But he's he's a good Iron Man. He doesn't get hurt a lot. Well, except that early in the season, he seem, until this year, he seems to get banged up. But then from that point forward, he's healthy. Yeah, I mean, he's had those times when he's been out for a little bit, but, you know, he's not constantly getting injured throughout the year. And then the next game, the Flames rode their win streak against the LA Kings, a team that the Flames have done pretty well against so far this season. And the Flames scored on scored on four of their first 11 shots in the game as Goudreau and Monaghan each tallied three points, leading the Calgary Flames past the LA Kings. This was an interesting game, I think, if for no other reason than Jonathan Quick got yanked in the first period after two goals. And they put Bishop in, and he didn't look all that better. All that much better. And the Flames just basically came out and skated circles around the Kings throughout the game. And, like, the Kopitar goal was in the first period. That was a mistake by Bartkowski losing him. And the Dowd goal was just a excellent tip. But other than that, like LA did not have any offensive pressure that like it where like oh, you know they're gonna score here. It, like they, there was lots of scrambly play in front of Elliott, and he did have to make some tough saves. But like there was no sustained like you're just expecting the goal to come at any See- point. And if you remember, we played L.A. back in February on February 28th and won 2-1 to one in overtime. And I thought in that game the Flames played better than the scoreboard showed. I thought that the Flames should have got a lot more, but Bishop kept them in. And in this one, I think that this, you know, I was expecting L.A. to come out with a little more jump and try to, especially with where they are in the standings, really try to take Calgary out of this one. But I think we're seeing why L.A. is not a playoff team. They just didn't come to play. No, and like... 
tonight they're back in action against LA or against Edmonton. Another very important game to them, and they're already down two nothing in the first intermission as we're recording now. So, I I think you can pretty much pencil in the eight teams that are in the playoffs right now as the actual eight playoff teams and it now it's just a matter of figuring out who's going to be playing who the one thing i did like about this game that was fun as a flames fan was that the flames got two quick goals in both of the first two periods we had sean monahan uh score and michael stone score in the first and then right on in the second i mean 47 seconds in we had Giordano and Goudreau score. So good ways, I think, to set the tone for both periods. Come out there and put up a lot of offense very quickly. Yeah, and that Goudreau goal totally caught Bishop off guard because he was looking like you could see on the replay that he had already closed the five hole, expecting that, not expecting the backhander to go right into the top corner. I think when I watched this game and broke it down, I thought the Flames had really good puck management, and they did a great job of setting the pace right from the beginning. They were managing the puck well. They were making L.A. skate around more. And you could tell, I could tell almost right away after about the Giordano goal that the Flames were just going to win this one. They just had that. You could just see they were playing a better game than L.A. They were playing more drive. Yeah, oh, for sure. Like, I was not really in any doubt of the final score at any point in the game because L.A. just didn't seem to be able to get anything through our defensive coverage at all. And, you know, this was a game when I didn't think Elliot looked great, but I didn't think Elliot had to look great. Elliot did, as you said earlier, he did what had to be done to get the job done, but this wasn't a standout game for him, but it was a milestone game for him. He ended up tying a franchise record for 11 straight wins, and he ties with Mike Vernon, a Flames, uh, you know, Flames legend, one of the two numbers that's been retired. And that's, you know, for a guy, as we were talking about, who came in and struggled so much, getting that kind of a record, 11 straight wins, is a pretty big thing, especially when you've had a uh, hot and cold season. Yeah, and after, like, January, I think that very few people would have th- – thought that it would have been made any sense to bring Brian Elliott back for next year. I was even doubting it at one point. But things change rather quickly. And uh, Mike Vernon had had some things to say when he was asked today. Mike Vernon said, getting on a roll like that, that's always a good thing. I think that the diff- the thing that differentiates what I did and what Brian Elliott has done is I think points are harder to come by now with the tight race. They're still fighting for a playoff berth. And to put an 11-game streak together, that's a great feat. And I think it'll it comes in a timely fashion for the organization. These are big games right now, knocking off teams like L.A. They're nipping at their heels. It gives them a bit more breathing space. I think that's the biggest difference, end quote. So, you know, good to, good to even hear a guy like Vernon admitting – that the game is changing and it's harder to do what we, what you do now. And, you know, I think it is, it, he's right. I mean, it gives the flames that much more breathing room and LA is a weird team. They are built like they should be a good team and they're not playing that way. And they have for a few seasons now. Well, even when LA won the cup a couple of times, they were not overly good in the actual regular season standings. And like, I recall they were the eighth seed one year when they won. So, it's they've always been a bit of a weird team um couple lineup moves in this one that were interesting we had michael Furlan sitting out unfortunately he was uh quarantined due to potential mumps so the team wanted him to sit out and as such they had to draw somebody into the lineup at, at the forward side they had two choices freddie hamilton and curtis lazar and the team ended up taking curtis lazar putting him on the fourth line matt what'd you think of lazar in this one well he doubled his point total for, yeah, the, for the season he got an assist on the empty netter uh i thought he was good there's he's not gonna be a top offensive player but he was very effective in crashing and banging and that's the kind of game he needs to play and the flames seem to be building a team that's going to be built for the playoffs where they're just going to thump the ever loving <clears throat> out of <laughs> every team that they play against and having guys like Furland, Boma, Lazar, Bennett, Kachuk, like a Brower, like that's going to wear oppositions down. So 
I liked what I saw, and I'm expecting him to get more ice time as we move forward. Lazar got one hit, or sorry, three hits, one assist, um, and got credit for one takeaway. He played 10 minutes and eight seconds. I thought if you looked at his game, he looked good for his first game with the Flames. I don't want to you know, judge him too much after his first game. He made some mistakes, but he also made some really good moves. And I think there's a fourth line player. He did about what I expect him to. And I think you're right. He'll eventually get a little more time, a little bit bigger look. I wouldn't be surprised if he's not in the lineup in Washington. I don't think the Flames want to, if, if Furland's back, if Furland's not, he might be, but, um, I think that this is a guy that has at least got the confidence from the organization now to try him out a few more times. Yeah, and with Kachuk being suspended for a couple of games after elbowing Doughty in the first period of the Kings game, I'm expecting that Lazar will draw in the lineup at least for the next two days or two games. Well, let's talk about that. So there was a big, uh, a big elbow, big controversy. I'm sure everyone's seen it by now. Kachuk elbowed Drew Doughty. Um, on the ice, there was really no call on it. And today, uh, the following day on Monday, Kachuk had a, had a on-the-phone hearing with the NHL, and it was determined that he should be suspended for two games for that elbow. So, Matt, first off, what do you think? Do you think it's a fair punishment? Honestly, I was leaning more towards no suspension, but it, it is what it is. It, to me, the fact that Doughty came back in the game would lead me to believe it should be a fine more than a suspension. If Doughty was out, then I could see suspending, but it seems a little bit harsh. Yeah, well, I think it's just due to the fact that Kachuk's had a handful of incidents this year already, so I think that's probably the main reason why the NHL's like, okay, you're not changing your game, so here, sit for two. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit different. I was thinking, you know what, he's a young kid, and they want to nip this in the bud before it gets to be too much. But, you know, this is sort of that wheel of justice, as fans call it. It's It seems like the the crime doesn't always fit the the punishment, and it seems very arbitrary. There's no, you know, if you do this, this is how many games you sit. Um, so, I don't know, I think it's a little excessive. But at the same time, I don't think it's going to hurt the Flames as much as we might think it is. It's two games. It might hurt in Washington, but I think that with Lazar ready to go, um, you know, we have another forward right away. My first question for you, Matt, is do you think that Kachuk should tone down the way that he's playing? We've seen him do this kind of stuff. We've seen him be quite a physical force so far. Do you think he's going too far? That's the problem when you have a player like Kachuk. Uh, he's going to do things that are going to cause him to get suspended every once in a while. And... You know, uh, I don't think he should necessarily tone down his play. Just he has to pick his spots a little better. Drew Doughty said after the game, quote, he's a pretty dirty player, that kid. To be a rookie and play like that is a little surprising, end quote. So I don't know if it's necessarily a fact that Kachuk is playing this way or it's the fact that he's a rookie playing this way. I mean, he's, you know, Keith Kachuk's kid. We have to assume that this was kind of what we we're going to get. But at the same time, I think it's part of his game. And I think if you make Kachuk tone it down, you may not get what you're looking for out of him. Exactly. And like we all know that guys like Corey Perry and Brad Marchand are a bit of dirtbags themselves in much the same way that Kachuk is. So, it, you know, they still pull things from time to time, but it... It's just learning where that line is. That's and all. those guys are also very key parts of their team, too. You know, Corey Perry, Brad Marchand, they're big parts of those teams and what makes their team successful. So it's not like the, you know, Brian McGratton of old where you were just a, a replaceable bruiser. Yeah, and Kachuk is an important member of the team, probably in a similar manner as those two players, just due to the fact that he's a large reason why the 3M line has done so well this year, just as Backlund and Froelich have done well. And if the Flames didn't have Kachuk, I don't think the Flames would be in a playoff spot right now. So it's one of those things that he just has to mature a bit and no big deal. I think that, yeah, he, it's a bit of maturity, like you said, but I think that we're always going to see him play this way. The thing we have to be careful of is you don't want him to sort of become public enemy number one where teams start taking shots at him first. 
he is an offensive threat, and we need him on our forward core to be that offensive guy. So I think over the summer, the Flames can work with him. I think the Flames can, you know, t- let him know kind of what's going on, what he needs to change, maybe what he needs to tone down. But I think going into the playoffs, I'm excited by Kachuk and playing this way because I think it's really going to give the Flames some grit that they need, especially depending on who their playoff opponent is. Yeah, I agree. So with Kachuk out, Matt, who do you think will draw in the lineup? Do you think the Flames will bring somebody up from the AHL and draw them in? Do you think it'll be Lazar, Hamilton? What do you think the Flames do? Well, I think Jankowski deserves a recall, and he's been doing rather well this season for Stockton, so if I had to guess, you'd see him getting recalled and inserted into the lineup somewhere. I know you're a big Jankowski fan, and I disagree with you, but I'm just thinking with Lazar having played his first game, and he's here already, also with Stockton fighting for a playoff spot, I'm thinking that you'll just see the Flames put Lazar in and try to give him a few more minutes and see how he rises to the occasion. I just don't see the need to bring up a guy when you've got two extra forwards sitting out. And it's possible that that could be the case. They may want to see what Jankowski can do, though. That's I, th- the... I think there's a time and place for that, and I'm not sure that it's yet. What do you think? Like, If you bring Jankowski up now, yeah, you can see that, but do you think it would be better to bring him up maybe you know, in April when we've got this thing clinched and there's really no pressure on the kid? Do you think that it might be too much pressure bringing him in, changing that lineup up with a guy who hasn't been around, who doesn't know the other players? Well, I think the the team is, like, you're not going to win or lose a game based on one rookie playing. So, I don't know. I can see arguments both for and against, so. Yeah, I mean, I know you're a big Janko fan, and I'm not saying he doesn't deserve to come up. I'm just not sure, especially with the recall scenario after the deadline, if you want to burn one of those yet. Because we only get, what, three recalls left? Rasmus just got converted from a... Uh, an emergency to a regular recall. So, yeah, maybe. We'll we'll find out, and we'll see when the Flames get to L.A. Um, also, we it's expected that Michael Furland will be sitting out the Washington game, so that leaves us down by two forwards. So, yeah, maybe they do bring up a farm guy. I don't know. If I was Freddie Hamilton, I'd be a little choked if you bring up a farm guy to play over me. Because Freddie's been here all year. Yeah, we'll see. So, Matt, after that L.A. game, if we take a look now, Calgary has 86 points, sitting at third point, third place in the Pacific Division. Edmonton is one point below us at 85 points. And Anaheim is one place above us with 87 points. Nashville's in the second wild card spot at 81 points. They're tied with St. Louis, who has third in the Central. And then we have L.A. at 75, Winnipeg at 71. Right now, I think that... Teams may change their order, but I don't think that we're going to see any movement in or out of the wild card. What do you think? No. Um, You also uh, neglected to add in that we're only five points behind the San Jose Sharks, and we do play them twice. So That's true. You know, it's unlikely, but stranger things have happened. I think that we may be able to pass Anaheim. We're playing them twice as well. But I I don't think at this point that we're going to race for the number one in the Pacific. No, neither do I. But it will be interesting to see because San Jose doesn't have exactly an easy schedule either. So could be. So we've we'll got, see. what, 10 games left? Yeah. Well, theoretically, we could pass Chicago too then. True, but, but that's un- extremely unlikely. Yeah. So I, I think at this point, you know, it's still possible that we may swap spots with Edmonton. Um, Edmonton, Nashville may swap spots, but I don't think you're seeing L.A., Winnipeg moving into either of those spots. I think that we've got Chicago, Minnesota, St. Louis, San Jose, Anaheim, Calgary, Edmonton, and Nashville as our eight Western teams for the playoffs. Yeah, and I think Chicago is going to end up playing Nashville and Minnesota will play St. Louis just due to the fact that Minnesota's schedule is, or St. Louis's schedule is so light that it, it's virtually impossible for Nashville to pass them, even though they're currently tied in the standings. Uh, and then when it comes to us, we're likely going to see Well, it's going to be a three-way battle, really, and all the Flames need to do over the last 10 games of the season is have a 
a tie with either Anaheim or Edmonton, and they'll finish ahead of them. So, because we have the first tiebreaker, so it's a real jump ball. It, we could be most likely we're going to be playing San Jose, Anaheim, or Edmonton in the first round. It just it depends on who basically at this point. And outside of this week, and we'll talk more about the upcoming schedule later, but outside of this road trip, every game is really against pretty much a playoff, a potential playoff opponent. Yeah, except for one game against the Avalanche. Yeah, and we got a couple against L.A., but um, two against L.A., still one against the Avalanche. But other than that, it's all... I mean, we need to treat even those games like playoff games in order to win this. So, Matt, I was doing some numbers last night. Um Looking at the teams the Flames have beat so far, I really wanted to go back and figure out. And this was mentioned, I was told, um, I passed by somebody who said that it was mentioned on Fan 960 yesterday too, I guess. But I was looking back. So far this season, as we know, the Flames have had a rocky season, but they have beaten 27 of the teams in the league. Remember, there's only 29 opponents. You can't beat yourself. That'd be weird. Um, And we've beaten 27 of those teams so far. The only ones the Flames have not beaten is they haven't beat Washington, but they've only played them once. The next game is tomorrow night. And the only team that they have not beaten and can't beat at this point is Edmonton. So, you know, the Flames have burned up all their games against the Oilers. We mentioned early in the year is kind of a weird schedule. But if you were to look at where the Oilers are now and where the Flames are now, if we still had a game on the schedule, do you think we'd be able to beat the Oilers? Oh, yeah, for sure. I do, too. Yeah, and it's possible that we could meet up in round one and we can show them how much we've improved. Exactly. But it's kind of, the reason I brought this up is really if you look at it, we've beaten every team but Edmonton um, and Washington. So really of the 27 opponents, we're showing we can beat almost anybody. You know, like pretty much everybody but two. And there's still a chance to beat Washington, but um, we can, we're can we showing that, you know, we can beat the best. We might not be consistent every night, but... Um, you know, at least once we beat everybody, and that's pretty awesome. That's pretty. That's a pretty cool stat, I thought. Yeah, well, Calgary has emerging as an elite team in this league, which is shocking in and of itself. So it's not surprising that they are able to go toe to toe with the best of the best and occasionally get two points, like that Pittsburgh game the other day. Yeah, and and I think that was really a game that showed me, or the game, I guess, that showed me that this team could be, you know, classified an elite team. When you can play like that against Pittsburgh, that says that you you've got a good team. Um, another stat that I was looking at, and I was looking back at some of our podcasts from this time last year and the year before, and this is usually the time of year the Flames run into injury troubles. Knock on wood. But this season so far, the Flames have been pretty healthy, if you look at it. Uh, Johnny Goudreau had his broken finger. That was a bit worrisome. But other than that, I mean, we've had Lance Boma, who had his shoulder injury, Troy Brower's finger, Chris Versteeg's had a number of different injuries. But these guys have been healthy overall. And I'm just hoping that that can stay, because if they start getting in injury trouble now, that could be the thing that really costs them the playoffs. Yeah, well, it's like what happened uh, in the last game against L.A. in 2015 when Hoodler and Monaghan both got hurt in that game and the Flames limped into the playoffs with two of their three members of their first line being obviously not playing well. Well, and even outside of that, I mean, we've seen years where the Flames have gotten close to the playoffs within a few points, and... You know, they, they've ended up getting so close that you can almost taste it. And then it's like, okay, we're, you know, 10, 20 games out. And now we're pulling a bunch of AHL guys to fill spots. And it just slowly, you know, falls out of reach. So, you know, I think that this year we have a few extra spots. And I think we're going to be tested to see how we can do with depth over the next little bit with Furland out and with um, Kachuk out for at least two games. But I think that, you know, if they do run into injuries, I don't think that we're deep enough where we could do an 04 and start pulling up, you know, no name AHL guys and still make a deep run. I think we have a good enough core. We could support a few of them, but I don't think you can support more than three or four injuries right now. Yeah, well, I think if every team would be in the same boat. Look at Pittsburgh. They're, they've been struggling a bit lately. Well, not really. They're 7 2 and 1 in their last 10, but. They're dealing with a huge amount of injuries as well, and yeah, eh, you can. It's just it's more difficult. Yeah, that's all. 
I guess it was just cool to see because it seems like the injury bug has been very prevalent for the Flames in the last couple of years, and this year it's not. Um, another story here that a lot of fans may not know, the Flames went out this week and signed two players to a contract. Nobody that you're probably going to see right away, but they signed um, Ryan Lomberg, who is a unrestricted free agent that they brought in last year. They brought him into their system in 2015-2016. He's played most of the season in Adirondack, playing 43 games in the ECHL and got 35 points. And this year he got promoted full-time to Stockton, where so far he's played 57 games. He has eight goals, 11 assists for 19 total points, 115 penalty minutes. This is a guy who I think has a very similar game to uh, Garnet Hathaway. What do you think, Matt? That was the exact comparison I was going to give. And I think, to me, this kind of shows that, you know what, he's an unrestricted free agent. He got signed. I'm kind of taking this as a sign that Hathaway probably gets recalled next year and they're going to leave Lomberg in the AHL to play that role down there. Yep, I agree. I don't I don't know that we're going to see Lomberg in the NHL. I think that we have a few other guys who probably could play that role temporarily. But mind you, we didn't expect to see Hathaway in the NHL either. I just don't know if there's enough room for two of them on the team. Well, it's up to him, basically. Yeah, I think it'll be one or the other. Like, I think it'll be either Hathaway that might make the team or Lomberg, but I don't think he'll bring both of them up. No. I think that he'll eventually get a cup of coffee in the NHL, but I'm not sure if he'll be a full-timer. Yeah, he might be the kind of guy you bring up, you know, if, say, Lomberg or if uh, Hathaway gets hurt or a guy like Boma's out and you just need some muscle in the lineup. Lomberg is kind of an interesting player. He's five foot nine, 191 pound left winger. And I mean, he's, he's become kind of a crash and bang winger. So you don't usually see that from a guy that small. So that's kind of cool. And I guess, you know, now Johnny's not going to be the only guy on the, you know, sub six foot scale for the team. The other player that the Flames brought in this week and signed to an entry-level contract out of the Ontario Hockey League London Knights was their draft pick from, uh, what was it, last season? Yeah, 2016, round two, number 54 overall, Tyler Parsons. And Parsons, uh, he's I think it's a good signing. He's a six foot one, 185-pound goalie, but he's been battling injuries this year. Um, he's only played 34 games, posted a .925 save percentage, leading the entire league. Um, but you know, he hasn't played as, as well. And I think that's a testament to, or sorry, not, not play as well, not played as much, but I think that's a testament to him that he can come back after an injury and really get that kind of, you know, number still. And I would not be surprised if we see Parsons turn pro next year. What about you? Well, they may decide to opt to keep him in the, the farm or in uh, juniors just to not burn the roster spot. But yeah, well, that's true. There's a bit of a goalie logjam right now, so you might be better to keep him in juniors and let him play out as a starter there. Um, overall, though, what are your thoughts on Tyler Parson, Matt? I think he and Gillies are 1-2 for our goalie prospects moving forward, and he could very well become the Flames starter in a few years, or it could be Gillies, or neither, depending uh, We've had periods where we've had lots of goalie prospects and none of them pan out. So I know there's knows? a lot of Flames pundits who are really high on this kid. I know um, Pat Steinberg, for example, has said that he thinks that this could be our starting goalie in a few years. I can see that. It just uh, goalies are weird and hard to predict. So hard to tell. And not only are they weird and hard to predict, they often take a long time to develop too. So having a whole bunch of them in the system often is going to give you a better chance of success and. You know, right now, as much as I think you're right about Gillies being the number one, if I were to pick a goalie this year to call up, I think it'd be Riddich over Gillies. Yeah. Well, Gillies did get recalled on an emergency basis, but I think that's because the Stockton's wanting to make a run for the postseason. Mm -hmm. so, we'll see. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Parsons. Um, like I said, I can see him turning pro. He's on a three-way entry-level deal. And Lomberg is on a two two year two way deal, so both very good for the Flames. Both guys that were probably going to be around here anyways, and I think it'll be interesting to see how both of them look come rookie camp. We always see that these guys who, at least I've noticed, not about you, Matt, but we've been to the last few rookie camps, and usually a guy who signs a contract either looks significantly better or significantly worse than the year before. Yeah, and that will be one of the things to watch. With it's all, either the pretty pressure much. of the contract or, you know, they're, they're not feeling that pressure. 
So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, any other stories you want to talk about this week before the Flames' big road trip? No, not really. It's been a relatively quiet week as the season's dwindling down to the wire. We've got, what, two more, three more weeks of it, the NHL season. Yep, and then the fun begins. It's weird. When we look at the when we look at the season, when you and I start podcasting every year, and you look at this 82-game season, you go, oh, there's going to be, you know, forever this season takes. And there's some times in the middle, and you and I talk about around December, January, where the season just feels like it's going to drag on. But especially this uh, this month and last month, the Flames have really given us you know, something to be happy about. And I, I haven't felt like the season's been dragging on. They've been giving us a lot of great storylines, and the win has been a lot of fun. Yep, I can't argue with you there. Let me ask you something before we get into looking at the week. Right now, the Flames are hot, and if they stay hot going into the postseason, do you think that this is one of those things where it's better to cool off a little bit before the postseason, or do you think it's better to come in hot and try to ride that wave often we see teams that come in hot sort of cool down in the postseason because you can only be hot for so long i guess what i'm asking is do you think it's good that we have this win streak now or would you rather have had it earlier in the year and then maybe come into the postseason a little cooler well it, it really just depends on the team like some teams have ridden the wave right through into a couple of playoff series wins so I don't really think that it translates too much, really. It just the matchup is the most important thing, and whether or not the goalie's playing well. Well, Matt, I, I think you're. I think you're definitely right about that. I think we're a young team, and we just have to roll through the schedule here. And speaking of the schedule, why don't we get to our predictions game, shall we? Yep. Looking back at last week, you finally won one, Matt. I know. Strange the, things are happening. The Flames had six points, three games on the board. I was over ambitious and thought we'd win all three. I thought we'd m make our way through Boston, no problem. You were more realistic, I guess, thinking that the Flames would lose to Boston but win Dallas and L.A. So with that, you get two points, one for the right team and one for the right points, and now we're 9-3 to three on the season. I'm coming for you. I got six points available to me left in the regular season. So You got to get all I'm, six. Yep. What do we do if we tie? Do we have a shootout? Coin toss. There you go. That that won't enrage anybody. No. Um, so if we look ahead, this is the Flames' last real road trip of the season. I guess second last. They have another California trip um, in April. But the last one of this month, on the 21st, the Calgary Flames go to Washington to play in Washington. It's a 5 p.m. Mountain start time. On the 23rd, they play against the Nashville Predators in Nashville, 6 p.m. Mountain Start Time, and then an early game on Saturday, a 5 p.m. Mountain Start Time against St. Louis. Three playoff teams. Uh, and we also, next Monday, we're playing oh, you're right. against Colorado. That's right. Too. And then Monday, we're back in the Dome against Colorado, uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Start Time. So if you want to go to a game and uh, watch the Flames probably definitely win one, that's one you have to win. You can't you can't be this good and lose to Colorado. So get your tickets for that game from our friends at Tick Ticks. Four games on the board, three playoff teams. How do you think we fare, Matt? Six points. I think we're going to drop the Washington game and win the rest. All but Washington. Yeah. Washington's going to be a tough team. Yeah. I think that I think the Flames that may end up being like a Boston game for the Flames. Um. And they're going to be without... I think it's already been said that they're going to be without Furlan for that game. Yep. So no Furlan, no Kachuk. You could be right. I, th I think that they'll lose that one. Um, I know they're going to beat Colorado. They have to beat Colorado. Though knowing how the Flames have been the last couple of years, they'll probably choke on Colorado, but I'm hoping not. I heard you laugh. Like You, you know it's very likely yeah. to happen, don't you? Oh, yeah. If you're going to blow one, that's the one to blow. Well, that's it. Um, I don't know. I just I had this weird vision in my head that we're going to lose handedly to Colorado. It's going to make 5-1 or something. And, sort of like and, that Arizona game last month. Yeah, and, and I mean, at that point, fans are going to say, oh, you know, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. We lost to Colorado, but I don't know. I just I had this weird notion in the back of my head they're going to lose. But I'm going to predict that they win that one. I think they win St. Louis. And I think they're going to get one point against Nashville. I think Nashville is going to be a tough team. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to say five points on the week. Um, 
So I'm almost where you're at. And I think this is a week where, you know, you'll really see the Flames playing playoff hockey. They have to to win this week. And after that, they have two easy games, and then they're back to playing all playoff teams pretty much. So it's coming down to the wire here. We got 10 games left. And, Matt, right now the Flames are on a two-game win streak, so only nine games to go until we break the franchise record. Yeah. Which means every game uh, right up to the end, or realistically, they could win every game right up until the Anaheim game. Yeah. We'll see. All right, my friend. Well, you have a good week. Enjoy this road trip. Thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great week, and we'll see you this time next week. We'll talk to you next week as the Flames make their way back home. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.